Hi, everybody. I'm Pierce Salguero from Penn State University, and welcome to another of the ISDAM webinars. During this pandemic period, we've been uh, taking to Zoom in order to share research and uh, ideas with each other. And uh, this, this webinar is going to be a little bit different than the others because it was not conducted live. Uh, the webinar is a compilation of three different talks that were given on my campus at uh, Penn State's Abington College outside of Philadelphia. And this was part of our Health Humanities uh, speaker series for spring 2020. The focus of the series was on Asian responses to COVID-19. And we had a number of scholars come and give um, presentations on lots of different topics, including uh, religious responses to COVID, we had a panel on um, specifically looking at Korea. We had a panel uh, looking at vulnerable populations that included um, presentations on Islamophobia, as well as um, the experience of people with disabilities in Japan. Um, and of all of these talks, um, I have selected three that specifically relate to traditional Asian medicine to put together to create a webinar sort of after the fact um, for our colleagues um, in the ISDEM uh, circle and, and, and around the world. Uh, so um, keep in mind, these are gonna be three talks that were given on separate occasions that are sort of spliced together, um, but I think they do uh, speak to each other very well. Um, they, they cohere together, even though they may, they may reference something that isn't um, part of this video. Um, they, I think, uh, uh, are going to um, be an interesting combination of perspectives. So um, without further ado, I would like to um, introduce the first speaker, the first uh, presentation. And um, this is a presentation by Yen Liu, who's at the University of Buffalo. And his presentation is called Combating Epidemics, a Historical Perspective. This talk was given on February 11th of this year, and it examines a wide array of strategies developed by medical figures, religious practitioners, and political actors in fighting epidemics throughout Chinese history. Uh, Dr. Liu reflects upon how these varieties of measures could inform our contemporary thinking and handling of contagious diseases. So um, Dr. Liu is an assistant professor at um, SUNY Buffalo, like I mentioned, and he specializes in the cultural history of medicine in pre-modern China, with particular interest in the material culture of medicine, the history of the body and the senses, religious healing, and the global circulation of medical knowledge. His first book, which is uh, going to be open access, is called Healing with Poisons, Potent Medicines in Medieval China, and it will be published by the University of Washington Press shortly. So take it away, Dr. Liu. So uh, I, I don't know whether uh, Dr. Sakura mentioned this today is Chinese New Year. Just want to wishing you all a happy Year of Ox. Today's uh, uh, this year is the Year of the Ox. Uh, uh, but I, I do have a different, a, a, a more relevant point uh, regarding Chinese New Year, uh, which brings uh, my talk back to uh, 2000 years ago during the Han period time. Uh, during the Chinese uh, New Year season, uh, particularly in the very last months of the preceding year, there was a particular uh, method uh, sponsored by the Han court, Han government, right? So uh, to combat epidemics, and this is a, a, a ritual performance uh, generally called the Great Exorcism uh, Dano. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the various causes, perceived causes of epidemics uh, in ancient China. But here, just to focus on the ritual itself, basically in the imperial palace, uh, there was a ritual master often dressed in costumes with animal motifs. This is one image from a tomb, uh, in, uh, a Han tomb. And he was followed by a group of youth dressed in similarly in costumes. And they play this kind of ritual dance and as a way to expel the demons that they consider plague of the, the palace, right? So responsible for the pestilences. And the idea is so at, at the end of the preceding year, they perform this kind of uh, ritual uh, 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 performance to try to get rid of those demons. 
and so clear the you know the atmosphere and embrace the new year with fresh spirit. So that's one uh, sort of high profile uh, method sponsored by the Han court to try to deal with uh, epidemics in Asian times. Um, and some of you may uh, know that there is a, a sort of similar uh, ritual performance, uh, more popular in the in, in the folklore a circle, uh, the Nian beast, right? The Nian means ear in Chinese, but Nian also referred to a particular beast that invaded villages uh, in the New Year's New Year season and then uh, you know introduced diseases, uh, bothered the people there, and they tried to scare the beast away by doing this kind of firecrackers, you know, or uh, uh, play, uh, put on re really red things to scare, scare his beast away. So another sort of, you know, more uh, a similar uh, exorcistic um, uh, uh, ritual to try to get rid of uh, these animals, these demons that uh, were held responsible for diseases, including epidemics. Although this, this legend actually came up much later in the 19th, 20th century, this is a creation of of, of, of a legend of Nian beast. But you can see this continuation of perceiving epidemics uh, as demon or beast induced diseases throughout Chinese history. So that's one episode, one way of thinking about uh, epidemics in Asian China, but that's obviously not the only one. Uh, I'll give you a second episode that took place around the same time as the first uh, episode uh, about the course ritual. Uh, this is uh, written by a scholar, uh, a politician in the second and third century uh, to the end of the Han Dynasty. And he wrote an essay called Speaking of Epidemic, Epidemic Qi. This is a particular, uh, in this essay, he particular addressed an event, an epidemic, epidemic event in 217. And it was a tragic event ravaging the northern part of China. Uh, a great number of people died from this epidemic, sometimes a whole family, the whole lineage. Uh, just perished, it was tragic. And he also observed that uh, the epidemic particularly struck hard on the poor people uh, because the lack of resources and the rich people, they have good resources, they tend to be better off uh, uh, with such an uh, unfortunate event. And finally, he made some observation that, uh, that is, he's actually offered a critique of people uh, during his time who believe in the cause of uh, epidemics as demonic attacks. Remember the, the, the ritual performance I showed before? And he considered that's laughable. He considered epidemics uh, during his time was caused by the discordance between the yin and the yang and the unseasonal sort of events uh, uh, at the time. So he used this kind of more climatic explanation to explain epidemics rather than using demons. So that's another, you know, uh, episode to give you a sense of, you know, the, the various views of understanding epidemics in, already in, in Asian China. So uh, in today's uh, talk, I'm going to uh, introduce three uh, the basic things about uh, uh, epidemics in China. The first is the defining epidemics, how the epidemics were defined uh, in Chinese uh, language. Uh, and then furthermore, I'm going to talk about various ways of understanding epidemics. And finally, um, uh, how, 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 how do people treat or fight epidemics in the past? So uh, starting from uh, the definition of epidemics, um, so this character E actually we still use it today to refer to epidemics in Chinese. Uh, it has uh, ancient roots, uh, according to a first century, uh, the first dictionary uh, in Chinese, Shuo Jie Zi. It basically explains E is uh, that all people are sick, right? So basically it's a, it's, it's a disease that happened upon a large population, uh, a large population. So in that case, it, it's similar to the English word epidemics. The etymology of that word basic epi is above. Epidemics means population. So uh, an event that happened upon a large population, right? So you can see that uh, it emphasizes the scale of uh, the event, the disease, but it doesn't say anything explicitly about the contagiousness of the disease, right? So that's different. Epidemics disease is not always contagious, right? So, um, but there are other characters uh, in Chinese language that are more uh, uh, explicit, showing the uh, contagious nature of uh, epidemics. For example, uh, this character, uh, Zhu, According to a third century dictionary, uh, it defines Jew as pouring or uh, other types, sometimes translated as, translated as infestation. 
And the definition here is that one, when one person uh, die, uh, so the qi of that person's body uh, can be poured into the adjacent living people and making them sick and sometimes die, right? So here you can see clear there's the sense of contagion, right? Contagion particularly, the origin of contagion is from a dead body, the corpse. And that can be the site of contamination spreading the disease uh, out. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, that, that's the second character. The last character I want to introduce uh, this this character Ran, uh, which again we still use this character today in Chinese, uh, which literally means uh, dying. This is not dead. It's dying means you know dyed fabric, right? So dye the color of it. And so from the seventh century on. This word entered the medical uh, treatises and the physician used this word to refer to the contagious nature of the disease, right? Just like dyeing the color, spreading the color to the adjacent people and make them sick. And then from the 10th century on a term called ran, literally means transmission by dying appeared. And then in the following century became, centuries became the uh, one major term to refer to contagion. And this uh, word still, we use it today in modern Chinese China, right? So, so that's, these terms refer to the, the contagion nature of epidemics. So the second part, uh, I want to uh, give you some basic introduction of the understanding of epidemics, uh, particular with the focus on etiology, uh, which means the cause of illnesses, right? So there's a various way of understanding uh, etiology in, uh, in pre-modern China. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, point out three factors. The first, as I already indicated in the opening episode, is the demonological factors. So the disease, particular epidemics, were conceived to be caused by demonic entities. Right? This idea of uh, demonic attacks, which is, uh, this is a Chinese character for uh, demons, ghosts, or spirits in, uh, in nature called Bui. Uh, it's a very broad, concept uh, depends on the particular context. But I will say in the uh, medical context, it tend to always refer to something negative, bad, uh, inflicting disease onto the body, either you know, uh, the demons descending from uh, the heaven or sometimes the ghosts from the ancestor, right? Uh, plaguing the, uh, the, uh, the, de the descendants if they're not pleased. So this idea can be traced back to very early time, as early as in the third century before the common era, we have the evidence excavated text shows that demons attacks were considered responsible for uh, um, annihilating the whole family, uh, which indicates uh, the contagious nature of such uh, attack. And during the medieval period from third century on with the rise of the Buddhist and Taoist the, uh, the, the healing you know, in, in China, uh, the demonology became more uh, uh, diversified and enriched uh, from the third century on. And this is uh, one of the a few illustrations of demons from uh, eighth century Buddhist text showing you know, the various uh, demons with kind of uh, grotesque shapes. And they were uh, considered to be responsible for a variety of diseases, including epidemics. And so, and uh, to get rid of these demons by ritual performance, that drugs were considered uh, a major way by uh, various uh, religious practitioners at the time to cure uh, epidemics. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one, uh, uh, I, 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 I refer it to uh, as uh, meteorological factors, right? The factors related to the climate, the weather, the, 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 the larger cosmic, cosmic uh, movement. So um, there are various terms that appeared in the medieval period, such as heavenly movement, seasonal qi. Actually, these are disease terms often referred to uh, epidemics. And you can see by this term, you can see that uh, uh, the, the, the explanation of epidemics is more uh, cosmological and meteorological than demological, right? So, and particularly the idea of yin yang, which uh, the second episode I introduced at the beginning by Cao Zhi, he, that uh, uh, particularly uh, emphasize the uh, imbalance of yin yang in the cosmos as a, a, a cause of the rise of a variety of epidemics during his time. And this idea was crystallized in the foundational Chinese medical text during the Han period called Yellow Emperor's Inner Classic, Huangdi Neijing. And the text particularly emphasized 
uh, the idea of unseasonal seasons can cause all kinds of illnesses, including epidemics, right? Unseasonal seasons means here, you know, in, in the winter time, it's uh, unseasonally warm and vice versa, you know, the summertime is really cold. And that disturbance of natural rhythm of the movement of the cosmos was uh, the cause of a variety of diseases. And later on, there is also, actually in this text already, it mentioned uh, uh, another concept called the worm disease, uh, which later on in the late imperial China it became much more prominent in terms of explaining uh, epidemics uh, that's called uh, Wenbing, right? So the idea of Wenbing in the uh, Yellow Empires, you know, classic basically is, is the disease has this latency, right? The, in the winter time when there's unseasonal season, the disease is latent there and in springtime it can break out and have all kinds of uh, manifestations or symptoms on the patient. Right, so there's the sense of progression of the disease over time uh, implied by, uh, by such disease. And another uh, very important figure to the end of the Han Dynasty is Zhang Zhongjing, which, uh, who further elaborated this, uh, this idea of disease was caused by this kind of meteorological disturbance, particular conceptualized in the uh, cold poisonous qi as manifested by his uh, writing on cold damage, Shang Han Lun. And the idea is that there is, is you know, because of the you know, uh, uh, seasonal uh, disturbance uh, in the cosmos, in the larger environment, uh, there is an uh, invasion of this cold poison sea into the body. And depends on the, how deep the penetration is, uh, these poison sea uh, 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 can reach, uh, you get various level of severity of the diseases. And this uh, treatise actually is uh, very influential in terms of explaining the cause of epidemics, and we can come back in a minute that you know during the later period, Song period, uh, it was elevated to a major uh, a piece of work in terms of uh, thinking of and combating epidemics. So uh, I want to say a bit something more about the meteorological factors here uh, by bringing the concept of body politic. That is from the very early on in the Han time, if not earlier, there was this uh, conception that the physical body of the individual was in resonance with the political body of uh, you know, a, a polity. And then the largest circle of that is the cosmic body, right? The three uh, was in resonance with in harmony and then achieved a, a, a health, not just the individual, but the political, political god body at large. And particularly, I want to emphasize uh, the, uh, the issue of morality here, uh, particularly uh, during the Han period of time, uh, for example. Uh, so the, the bodily health can serve not just the physical health, but also the moral health, moral hygiene here. That if a lord or king did something wrong, there would be a cosmic conse consequences manifested by, for example, the earthquakes, uh, flood, and epidemics. And you can see that uh, that idea, that uh, mentality can be, uh, can, can, can be reversed. That if there's any epidemics, for example, that happened uh, in the world, uh, uh, one explanation is that that was because of the fault of the leader of the country who did something wrong, right? So, and from, uh, from the Han period of time, they sometimes did this kind of uh, confession or, you know, a repentance to, uh, uh, issue an edict to the country uh, people saying that, you know, well, I did something wrong in the preceding year. That's why, you know, there's epidemics. And then in the following year, I rectify my behavior and hopefully, you know, there are no such bad consequences, right? So I think that aspect of morality is important when we think about uh, uh, epidemics uh, in the framework of the body politic. Um, so finally, the third factor I want to brief uh, touch upon is the environmental factor, particularly in the local regions. And this factor has actually become more uh, 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 prominent in the later period, uh, uh, in the Tang period. And so this is a sort of Tang territory uh, in the seventh century. And you can see that the capital of the court uh, was located in the northern part in Chang'an. Uh, but there is expansion of the territory to the far south. I want to direct your attention to this part of uh, the empire, which is the modern day Guangdong and Guangxi provinces. And for people, uh, for political leaders and the majority of population living in the North, the far South was the mysterious and uncivilized regions full of poisonous herbs 
miasmic vapors and uh, responsible for a variety of local diseases uh, and including epidemics. So people, when we went there, they rarely went there during the time, often time they were banished there for punishment. Uh, it was like a death sentence. They, 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 they don't consider, they didn't consider can come back, right? So the environment is so hostile. And particularly there is a, a imagination of the, the poisons vapors there as zhang qi or miasma that was often used as an explanation of the variety of epidemics uh, rising in our region, right? So this is a third factor is local, is the geographical linked uh, 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 explanation of epidemics. So uh, my last part of talk will uh, uh, goes to the treating epidemics, uh, which is connected to understanding epidemics, right? It depends on how people understood the, the causes of epidemics. They came up with a variety of remedies. And here I'm going to give you four group of people's uh, treatments. Of course, there's no clear boundary between them. This is just a general picture of various strategies they adopted. Uh, to fight epidemics. The first is by government. And you really get a, a sense of that in a Han period when they use this great exorcism uh, during the New Year season to expel demons in the palace. And during the Tang period of time, uh, the government established the Imperial Bureau of Medicine uh, at, the, at uh, the capital of the, uh, the empire to offer medical supplies to officials and imperial family. And there are four branches of uh, this Bureau of Medicine that involves drug therapy, acupuncture, uh, sorry, that's acupuncture, and a therapeutic exercise. And then the last one is incantation. And I highlight incantation there is because uh, it's particularly emphasized in that Bureau, they are responsible to fight off epidemics. So in a sense, this is a continuation of the Greek exorcism during the Han period, but with more technical specialization incorpor incorporating both Buddhist and Taoist healing techniques uh, into their uh, healing repertoire of the government, right? So this is one uh, uh, example. Another example is in the falling dynasty of Song, particularly in the Northern Song dynasty in the 10th, 11th century, with the rise of printing, the government took advantage of that to establish a corpus of medical uh, writings they consider important. Uh, including the cold damage treatises, uh, like the one by Zhang Zhongjing I introduced before, uh, partly because of the rising uh, uh, number of epidemics in the 11th century. So they consider this text could be very useful to fight ac academics, and they disseminated the text to uh, uh, all over the uh, empire. So the second group people I want to uh, uh, talk about a little bit is the religious practitioners. I think uh, Dr. Sagara will talk more about the Buddhist healers in a later event. Uh, here, just the broadly, you know, both Buddhist and Taoist practitioners from very early on, uh, they used the uh, advocated their techniques and skills of treating epidemics as one powerful way of uh, recruiting followers and uh, religious persuasion. Uh, this includes uh, repentance of the individual, uh, uh, oftentimes in a religious context that constitute a very important factor. It starts with the patient's self, you know, uh, examination of what's wrong, particularly morally, uh, uh, more, the, the, the wrong, more, uh, wrong deeds they did, right? So the, 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 to violate the moral principles. And then uh, they also offer a variety of techniques such as incantation, and this is a talisman. Uh, this is a much later talisman, but this tradition can be traced back to a much earlier time in medieval era. You can see the, the character Gui, as I mentioned before, is at the center. It was sort of surrounded by these, uh, by these uh, strange jokes. And at the end, it explicitly says the uh, killing of the demon and uh, expel the pestilent tea, right? This is one way of using the uh, the talisman to uh, ward off the attack of uh, the epidemic. So, and the third group I want to say a little bit about is the physicians. Uh, and so uh, their skills and techniques of fighting epidemics were very diverse. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, uh, drug therapy uh, was one uh, way to do it. And this is uh, a seventh century physician, uh, Sun Zimiao is one of the most famous physicians in uh, medieval China. And in one of his former collections, 
uh, he came up with a particular recipe using realgar, which is a, a arsenic compound, a realgar peel uh, to uh, expel epidemics. It's very interesting that you know he uh, his regular uh, his formula includes not just the in uh, ingestion of the peels, but also once the peel is burned inside the household, the vapor produced by the peel uh, was considered powerful antidotes to uh, expel the. Uh, demonic tea or, or, or poisonous influence in the atmosphere. Right? So another one he recommended is the betel nuts, which you can find in Southern China and Southeast Asia, still very popular in China these days, uh, in, in Taiwan actually these days, where you know, he recommend to use the betel nuts, chew the betel nuts and the fragrant, fra uh, fragrant taste or smell can expel the miasma, as you uh, may still remember, particularly the, in the far south of China. So these are some of the examples of drug therapy uh, they, uh, he recommended. Uh, but drug therapy was not the only way to go uh, with epidemics. Another physician around the same time actually emphasized more about the building of the bodily constitution. Right? This is a course physician in the seventh century and who wrote an influential, influential work on the etiology of diseases. And basically he would say that uh, all, most of the diseases we say is, is because of the depletion condition of the body. She, because the body is depleted of vital T, so there's, they're susceptible to external attacks of poisons, T, of demons, uh, right? So once the body is built up, right, so it's full, it's replete, and then uh, it can fend off all the you know, external attacks, right? So that's the idea, I think it's, it's from a sort of preventive perspective to build up a strong body to fight off epidemics, right? So, and the last group of uh, people I want to say uh, briefly is the Confucius scholars. And so from the very early on in the Han period time, there was debate actually among Confucius scholars, how to deal with epidemics, particularly contagious epidemics. Actually there are debates from ancient time uh, between contagionism versus anti-contagionism, right? So whether epidemics contagious or not. And the central concern here is that a lot of Confucius scholars actually was worried that people uh, is afraid of the disease because it's contagious. They abandon their family, they abandon their friends. So it destroy, destroyed the, 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 the social fabric, right? So as Confucius value always, always emphasized the harmony of society and the, the familiar relationship, they consider this such, uh, such behavior highly problematic, right? So some of them didn't believe the disease is contagious. Others believe, but with some uh, warnings or recommendations. I'm gonna just use one uh, prominent scholar in the, uh, 12th century to end my talk here. And his name is Zhu Xi. He's a leading figure in the so-called new Confucianism during the Song period time. And he's actually, he wrote about epidemics and he openly acknowledged the contagious nature of some epidemics. He said it's totally wrong not to acknowledge that. But he also emphasized that despite the contagious nature of the diseases, people should be brave and not abandon the family and friends should, you know, uh, uh, do something uh, to protect them, right? So to maintain that uh, uh, social order. So basically he advocates people not to focus on the profit, the lead, the personal profit, but rather on the righteousness, what is right, is right thing to do in the time of crisis, like epidemic, right? So I think that's one position he upheld, which is consistent with his overall uh, Confucius ideology of doing the right thing in the face of the grave dangers. Right? So to conclude, um, I want to just to have two very broad uh, conclusions here in terms of the Chinese understanding of uh, uh, epidemics in history, right? So there are diverse way of understanding and combating epidemics in Chinese history. Some we might be more familiar with, might be easier to fit into the biomedical framework today. Others might be more difficult, uh, so the narrative here, uh, I think, is not a, a one is better than, than the other. Uh, there's a progression of understanding of this. Actually, these various understandings and, and ways of treating epidemics coexisted throughout the Chinese history and embraced by various group of actors in society. Sometimes they were in tension, in competition. Sometimes they mutually borrow each other's idea. It's a more fluid uh, picture, compo composite pictures 
uh, than, uh, uh, than maybe we generally think. Uh, and second point is that a broad range of concerns related to epidemics, sometimes uh, uh, in, in, in our modern society, we tend to focus on the biomedical aspect of it, which is totally valid, right? The virus, the, the pattern of, 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 of contagion, right? So, but I, uh, I would like to remind you the importance, both in history and now, there are other issues connected to epidemics, uh, very prominent in pre-modern China, such as you know, moral cosmology, right? So the epidemics considered not just happen upon individual or particular group of people, but there are cosmological consequences and what a person need to do in the face of crisis dangers. Uh, that's often is uh, 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 emphasized by uh, scholars, physicians, religious practitioners. And that I think it's something we can all uh, think about in the current epidemics, uh, even if we have a very different kind of framework to think about it, right? So we have more scientific framework, but what is the right thing to do in the, in, 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 in the middle of a crisis between the personal protection and doing something bring more benefits to the larger society. And that's uh, almost like a perpetual theme for every epidemic back in history and now. So that's uh, my conclusion. And uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I'm very happy to address any questions. Thank you. Great. Our second panelist is James Flowers, who's going to present a talk called Bypassing the Technocratic State in South Korea, Doctors Mobilizing Korean Medicine in the COVID-19 Pandemic of 2020. This talk was given on the 3rd of February at Abington College. And in describing his talk, James says, the global media and politicians alike applaud the successful implementation of policies to crush the spread of the virus in South Korea but do not acknowledge that traditional medicine doctors prescribing herbal medicines played an important role in that success. Dr. Flowers is a brain pool program research fellow at Kyunghee University in South Korea. He's an historian of medicine in East Asia focusing on Korea and a Chinese medicine practitioner. He has a PhD in the history of medicine from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Thank you, James. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Salguero, and thanks to everyone for coming. So, yeah, so uh, Dr. Salguero just mentioned that I'm in the brain pool program and none of the panelists are scientists, but according to the Korean government, I'm a scientist because, well, according to the Korean, the Korean government, uh, Korean medicine belongs to science. So therefore, here we go. So I'm trained as a historian, but but I'm going to talk about COVID in Korea in 2020. So in the story of COVID in Korea, doctors remain anonymous with most commentators uh, attributing success against the virus to the state's effective implementation of public health, health measures, such as testing, contact tracing, quarantine, and biomedical treatment. And the narrative that we read in the media that the Korean population understands the needs for measures such as wearing masks and social distancing. I argue that this is a little bit simplified and that we need to understand Korean people's use of Korean medicine for COVID and Korean medicine in general. So I'll get on to what Korean medicine is in a few minutes, but I'm just summarizing here what happened in 2020. So how did this happen? So uh, the Korean medicine doctors as a professional body, they volunteered their medical services and delivered herbal medicines free of charge to any patients that needed it. And they did that, but the Korean media almost totally ignores them. I mean, most Korean people, if they didn't know about if they didn't know about Korean medicine themselves, they, you, you wouldn't know. <laughs> so what people did is bypass the state and made their own decisions to take responsibility for their own healthcare. So be clear that I'm not arguing that the, the government failed in its healthcare strategies on, strategies on COVID. Relatively speaking, they've been quite successful. They're not as successful as 
uh, some of the commentators in the US claim, but well, on the whole, it's much, probably we're much safer than in the US, I will say that. But they, what they do, what the government does is privileges technocratic solutions. But the evidence is different. The evidence says that, well, there was a grassroots movement where people practiced healing in a more traditional way. So just to be clear what we're talking about, first let's locate Korea on the map. So there it is, sandwiched between China and China and Japan, yeah. So there are just some quick figures. I'm not gonna read them out. So if you're interested in knowing the details, so probably just to notice that up to date there have been 1,441 deaths. That's quite a lot, but of course it's minuscule compared to the death in the US. So on the whole, successful. So what happened? At, be at the beginning of March, 2020, South Korea was second in the world in numbers of COVID patients. And there was quite a panic in Korea at the time. The government established centralized control of managing the epidemic. And most people know about the, the widespread testing available, and that's true. And most people know about that. So, so, you, so here's a very typical uh, article in the Western media. There are hundreds of these South Korea success. Yeah, that's good. So what the South Korean government has, uh, has popularized is what they call the three T's, but obviously in, that's in English, obviously it's not three T's in Korean, but here we, here we are testing, tracing, treatment. So testing you, is quite sim simple. Everyone knows about testing. There was, there's massive testing. So you could get testing very early and any, anyone who wanted a test, you just get a test, so that's good. Contact tracing, what's that? So there's uh, very, very careful cell phone tracking. So yeah, so there's widespread surveillance. So basically this is a level of surveillance that might not be that well accepted in Western countries, but it, it is pretty intense, the amount of surveillance there is. Now, the treatments that, that were used in the biomedical profession. So the argument is that these, the biomedicine, Western medicine is quite new, it's modern and so on, but we need to understand that all the effective treatments that we have are all old. Dexamethasone is the most effective drug. So that, that uh, became popular in the 1950s. Masks, of course, are old. Oxygen is old, and even vaccination is old. So if you study the history of medicine, you know that vaccination is about 200 years old. So we have the three T's. So I'm, what I'm saying is let's add K. So what is the K? So the K is Korean, Korean medicine. So I don't think there are any Koreans in the, in the meeting, but that's Korean um yang. So you might've heard of yin yang. That's the more familiar Chinese pronunciation. There's chi, ki. So I'm not gonna talk about the theory because 20 minutes is not really that long, but if you have questions about how it all works, I'm happy to talk about that. So it comprises herbal medicine, it comprises acupuncture, and yeah. So using these concepts to understand the body, Koreans consumed herbal medicine and acupuncture. So when Western medicine arrived in Korea in the late 19th century, Koreans still widely continue to use East Asian medicine. And everyone knows that, well, in the second half of the 20th century, Korea is famous for aggressive industrialization with a focus on modern science and technology. But at the same time, people still continue to use older traditions of medicine. And as for the status of doctors of East Asian medicine, their social status is, is high. And uh, with the establishment of Korean medicine and Western medicine as two parallel systems, 
protected and regulated by the state. So there's not much sense that Korean medicine doctors are inferior or kind of weird. They are pretty much accepted, not by everyone, but on the whole, yes. So medical schools, as in Western medicine and Korean medicine schools, they accept only the best performing uh, high school students into their six year training programs, followed by a tough residency. So in line with the difficulty of gaining entry into either medical program, uh, doctors of both forms of medicine enjoy a pretty high status in career in social terms and financial terms. So I'm just giving you a little bit of background here. Uh, what else? So if you go to Korea, I'm not sure if anyone's been there, but if you go to Korea, if you see this Korean words, you can actually see them in most streets in Korean cities, towns, villages, just everywhere. So what that means is that Korean medicine is extremely uh, popular. It's, it's, it's a constant fact of life in Korea. So just to give one example, in central Seoul, there's a famous market, which is quite large, which, well, people go to buy herbal medicine. So these are all herbal medicines. So visitors in this area will find streets and buildings full of bustling clinics, pharmacies, herb sellers, as we see here in this picture. There are about a thousand uh, merchants selling all different types of herbs and practitioners of Korean medicine. And yeah, here's an example. So there's a smell. So I don't know if anyone's tried this, moxibustion. So you can smell that in the area. So now moving to the actual events of 2020. So here we are. This is a kind of a publicity uh, slide that the Association of Korean Medicine put out. So, so when COVID started, the Korean medicine doctors, they waited for the government to include them in the plan for COVID. And to their surprise and actual like dismay, <laughs> the government just ignored them. And this was really weird. So in response, they vigorously lobbied, they pushed back and they demanded to meet with the government to say, what, 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 what are you guys doing? What are you talking about? Where are we? Because the state took full control of the whole plan in its, its uh, technocratic manner. So because of the pressure from the population, as well as the doctors, the state kind of relented. So after a few weeks in March, they, the government said, all right, you can see patients, but you can't actually see patients, you can set up a telemedicine center. So that was weird, but the Korean medicine doctors thought, okay, we can do this. And then they set up two centers. First in Taegu, so Taegu there you can see on the map in the southeast corner of the peninsula. So here we go. So Taegu, Honey University Hospital set up a telemedicine center in March. Then, so in the first few weeks, it was just on telephone because the government was not happy for <laughs> the doctors to actually look at people on the screen because they thought there's something uh, funny going on here. But finally, the government agreed that, well, you can actually talk to people on screen. So what happened? So moving to Seoul, there was a second telemedicine center. So in May, about 477 doctors had participated in this with 10,000 patients in the space of two months. So 320 students had participated. So it's important to remember that this is all voluntary and that the meaning they got no pay at all because the government was thinking, oh, what are you doing? But anyway, they did that. And also they gave up their own practice because all of the doctors, of course, have their own clinical practice. 
So it's important to know that Korea never locked down. There was never a lockdown. So what that means is that all clinics were still open, everything was still open. So these doctors gave up their own time and also they paid in money because someone had to fund all this. So the doctors themselves paid for this. Someone had to pay for the medicine, so they paid themselves. Yeah, the state just didn't, just didn't bother about caring about them. So, so up to May, there are 12,000 patients. So that comes to about 20% of all COVID patients. And then to get a better understanding, I interviewed four doctors over a period of two or three months. So many, many emails and, and Zoom, Zoom interviews. And so I, I, I wanted to get a sense of what they thought about all this. And so I can briefly introduce two of them. And I asked them if I could put their photos up, but they were too shy. So I, I'm not, sorry, I can't show the, show the image. So one for, for one, for example, is Dr. Yun. So Dr. Yun, he's from Taegu, the city in the Southeast. And another person is a Dr. Ha based in Seoul. So I also talked to the manager to try to get a better understanding. So Dr. Yun, he's age 30. So he's a, well, obviously a young guy and he's just opened his own clinic. So when I talked to him, he said that he, he volunteered and he went to the government himself. And he, he actually went to the government offices and said, why aren't you letting us see patients? And then he said, they said, well, we're not sure that it's, it's much good. Korean medicine is much good. And then he was really devastated. And then, so he was really disappointed. Then he talked to a lot of other doctors. And so there was a lot of discussion going on. Finally, when the telemedicine center was established in Tegu, he joined and he was really excited. Ha in Seoul also gave up her own time. She was actually finishing up a PhD and writing. Uh, so what about the types of therapies that they gave? So the therapies were just herbal medicines. And it's important to understand here about the individualization of patients. So in Western medicine, we understand a drug, for example, dexamethasone, right? Or there was a lot of talk about hydroxychloroquine, a drug, so a product, but that's not how it works in, in Korean medicine or Chinese medicine. So what it is is a, a very particular specific individualization of each patient. So each patient would have a different medication and that would depend on the range of symptoms. And so what the doctors are doing, they're not claiming they can cure COVID. They're not claiming that they can cure the most serious cases. So obviously if a patient needs to be hospitalized, the Korean medicine doctors advise them to go to the hospital if they couldn't breathe properly or they were, they were struggling. But for the patients who suffered the, they could still breathe, but they had very like flu symptoms and cough, fever, and then a lot of discomfort, muscle aches and so on. And so what would happen is that in a phone call that would last about 15 minutes, the, the doctors would ask a range of questions and they would determine what the symptoms were. And the idea is that you, you prescribe specific herbal medicines so that the, the patient's symptoms would be alleviated and lead to recovery. And so when I asked these doctors, Dr. Yun and Dr. Ha about examples, so they had plenty of examples. So for example, Dr. another doctor, I'm, I'm just coming thinking of another doctor called Dr. H who there was a woman who was suffering from insomnia, cough, headache. And so after taking some herbal medicines, her symptoms recovered. And she was, even she was surprised because she'd been to the Western medicine doctor and it wasn't working. So to cut a long story short, the, what the Korean medicine doctors argue is that uh, actually 
there are no effective drugs in Western medicine. The most effective is dexamethasone, right? But we all know that it's not, <laughs> it's not doing much, right? It's just decreasing symptoms by small margins, mostly. Anyway, so, and one of the things that came out, which, which uh, <clears throat> Dr. No, oh, well, soon to be Dr. No is going to talk about next time, is that Integral in the first uh, weeks of the crisis, many of the patients were Shinjon, Shinchonji, belonging to a, a Christian religious group. And so at the time, it was actually big in the news, even in the US, because I was in the US at that time, and then Shinchonji, they were all over the news, right? But they were being stigmatized in Korea. So they were actually, uh, Dr. No would know more about this than me, but my informants told me that many of them were actually turned away by doctors, and that's really shocking. But anyway, so I'm not going to make big claims there, but I just heard that. And so what the Korean medicine doctors decided that they're not going to discriminate against anyone. They're not going to stigmatize anyone. They're just going to... So what they decided was that much of their therapy was based not only on a medical basis, it was based, their therapies was more on a all round healing, which was to give advice on how to, on how to recover by staying at home and what foods they should eat. And, and a lot of the therapies were about emotional or psychologically counseling. Why? Because many of the patients in the early days were we're in a lot of fear, a lot of fear, and a lot of freaking out, and a lot of disappointment that they, that they said that they didn't know what to do. The hospitals were not taking people in. So I need to throw in a little aside here that the hospital beds even now are pretty full. So most people know that if you really need to be hospitalized, you're not, you're not certain to get a bed in Korea, right? So in the early days, it was even more hectic, where people had to go to the Korean medicine doctors and say, what, what am I supposed to do? How much time do I have left, Dr. Sergei? I, I, I was just going to jump in and, and, um, and, and thank you for your presentation. OK, and... so here we, here we go. <laughs> my last slide. So there's my conclusion. Uh, I could speak a lot more. Obviously, not. I, I have to stop. But here we go. So I'm just. What I've done is basically just argued that this is a clear case of Korean medicine offering, offering effective therapies. And, and when I, I've written an article about this, so when, in the article I argued that, that, man, if there's anything that we learned in 2020, even in 2021, is that Western medicine is limited. Come on, everyone knows that. I mean, it's obvious, it's, it's limited. It, so what I argue is that why, why are we not looking more at other therapies that many, con many people in many countries, such as Korea, such as China, such as Hong Kong, such as Japan, such as India, such as Sri Lanka, I could go down the list. So in a region of Asia where maybe half the people of the world live, where people routinely use these medicines, why are we just ignoring that? So that's another question that we'll leave for another time. So I'm leaving my last slide. So every, when I said we got to add the K, so everyone knows about K-pop, right? So yeah, there you go, K-pop, it's, it's so popular, but then I'm saying let's add the K-medicine. So. If I have to stop now, I'll stop. Okay, so our next speaker, um, who actually spoke before Dr. Leo in the in the actual order of events, is Dr. Joshua Park, um, and his presentation is called "From the Gold Rush to COVID-19: Chinese Medicine as Healthcare for Diverse American Communities." This talk. Uh, it will explore the role of Chinese medicine in epidemics through an examination of history in the US with an emphasis on 
its role in promoting the health of communities of color. Um, Dr. Josh Park is a licensed acupuncture physician and also a board certified Chinese herbalist here in the US. He graduated from the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland and was one of the first in North America to receive a clinical doctorate in the field of Chinese medicine. Dr. Park works in hospital settings across South Florida to provide integrative medical care for a variety of complex conditions. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Let me just share my screen here and we can get started. Here we go. Can everyone hear me and, and see the screen all right? Okay, excellent. Um, so today's topic, um, or at least my, my portion of today's talk, uh, talk is going to be on Chinese medicine as healthcare for diverse American communities. We're going to be doing an overview of the history of Chinese medicine in America, as well as spending some time talking about uh, Chinese medicine's role in some contemporary epidemics, uh, including COVID-19. So it may be surprising for some people to hear this, but Chinese medicine has actually been part of the healthcare landscape in America for some time now. Um, I would argue for almost 200 years, uh, Chinese medicine has been used by diverse American communities to achieve empowerment and health sovereignty. Um, I think that it can be said that its framework and techniques can provide a way for marginalized people to understand and respond to health challenges on their own terms. And we're gonna be exploring exactly um, how that's been the case for different communities throughout American history. Um, before doing that though, I think it's important to talk a little bit about what that framework is. Um, I'm not sure what your familiarity is with Chinese medicine, um, but I think it's important to, to sort of talk about uh, the unique way that Chinese medicine looks at disease and maybe contrast that with uh, biomedical models that you might be more familiar with. Um, so to start with, I would say disease is sort of an encounter between two different forces. You could say disease is the encounter between a form of stress and the human body. And that provides us kind of with two, uh, two ways a medical system can come to grips with disease. And so biomedicine, I would say, grabs hold of the external stress. And so if that form of stress is a pathogen like a bacteria or a virus or a fungus, um, biomedicine's approach is to eliminate that pathogen with antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals. We could say that this is a pathogenic approach to disease because it's very much focused on eliminating a pathogen. I would say with this model of disease comes a conception of the body as a kind of sterile chamber that has to be protected against contamination and whose sterility has to be maintained using uh, the interventions I, I already described. Now, in contrast to that, I would say Chinese medicine tends to focus on the other pole. So instead of emphasizing um, a pathogen or a stress, Chinese medicine grabs hold of disease by focusing on the human body. And Chinese medicine notes that the human body, among its many functions, already has the function of promoting health and stopping disease. And so rather than emphasizing the elimination of a pathogen, Chinese medicine emphasizes promoting the function of the human body, promoting what we might call the immune function um, or the body's ability to overcome pathogens. And so the various interventions of Chinese medicine, some of which you might be familiar with, these are things like acupuncture, uh, botanical medicine, but also things like breathing exercises, changes in diet, lifestyle modification. All of these are ways of stimulating the body's own ability to heal. Um, and so I would say that in contrast to biomedicine, this is a physiological approach to disease, to disease. It's concerned with promoting certain functions and capacities that are already present within the human body. And so with this conception of disease, instead of looking at the body as a sterile chamber, you're actually seeing it as more of a habitat, as more of a terrain in which a pathogen might find itself. And so instead of focusing on the pathogen, you're focusing on changing the conditions of the habitat, changing the conditions of the human body so that it's able to overcome disease. Um, and I would say these, that's a useful framework for understanding the differences between biomedicine and Chinese medicine. This is not an absolute distinction. Um, let me be clear about that. Chinese medicine does talk about the nature of pathogens. Likewise, I think in biomedicine, especially when you look at uh, recent research into things like the microbiome, 
you have an understanding that the quality of the bodily terrain is very important in maintaining health. Um, nevertheless, I still think that this is a, a useful framework for distinguishing their, their approach. Um, and something that I think makes this relevant to uh, communal health, and in particular, the health of marginalized communities, is that in Chinese medicine, the source of healing is found within the human body. It's not something external to the human body. It's just something that has to be activated or stimulated, but ultimately it is within the human body. And I think that's very appealing to marginalized communities who feel like they can't rely on outside support uh, from society at large or from the state. And maybe they even find themselves in opposition to, uh, to the state or to outside society. So to be able to rely on themselves and to tap into their own resources, I think can be a very empowering move. And I think that that can become a platform for waging a, a wider struggle for inclusion. And so that's just sort of um, a background for, for what Chinese medicine is and why it would be of interest for communities. Um, so the history of Chinese medicine in America begins with the history of Chinese people in America. Um, and we have the earliest records of Chinese immigration uh, beginning in the 1820s, so almost 200 years ago. Chinese medicine would have been the form of medicine that these immigrants brought with them. We have major migrations of uh, Chinese people into uh, America in the mid 19th century, coinciding with things like the California Gold Rush, the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, and agriculture, uh, mainly in, in the Western states. And so you have Chinese immigrants from the beginning encountering um, a great deal of, of racism from the white settler society. Uh, this is not, I feel like, so commonly known or emphasized, but you know there were outright uh, riots, lynching, massacres against Chinese populations uh, in America from the 1870s onward. And this culminates with the Chinese Exclusion Act, which is the only piece of legislation ever passed in the United States that actually excludes uh, members of an entire ethnic group from immigrating. And that was in place for almost 60 years. Um, and so you don't actually see after 1882, you don't see big waves of Chinese immigration again until the mid 20th century. Um, so that's some background for the first uh, figure and community we're going to look at, which is this gentleman here, Ing He, known as Doc He in the United States. Uh, He's born in 1862 in South China to a family of Chinese herbalists. That becomes his professional trade. He arrives in the US in 1883, probably one of the last uh, people to get in after the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And he settles in uh, the small town of John Day, Oregon. Um, so this would have been a, a, a rural community with a, a large Chinese population, mainly miners at this point. He partners with a fellow Chinese immigrant uh, and he opens uh, the Kamwa Chong, which is a trading post, general store, community center, and also a clinic mainly for the Chinese community. So he was a, a sort of frontier Wild West doctor practicing Chinese medicine um, in rural Oregon. And so initially he's mainly treating members of the Chinese community, uh, but gradually he starts to also treat members of the white community in John Day. Um, you know, in the 1880s, biomedicine was not very advanced, uh, and there were a lot of diseases that people still had to just kind of suffer through. And so I think probably this started with white settlers coming to him, maybe out of curiosity, maybe out of desperation, but uh, very quickly he achieved very remarkable results with his patients to the point that he became one of the, the go-to doctors for both the uh, white community as well as the Chinese community in John Day. Um, and from there, his reputation starts to grow uh, so that eventually he's seeing people from all over Oregon. People are traveling to come see him. And then eventually his reputation spreads to the point that people from other states are actually writing him, writing him letters saying, you know, my daughter's sick, she has a fever, we've, we've tried everything, can you help? And he would write back and send medicine to people. So I, I like the joke that he's kind of a pioneer of telemedicine. Um, the kinds of conditions that uh, Doc Hay was treating are the sorts of things you would expect to see in a kind of rural um, cowboy context, things like gangrene, meningitis, typhoid, frostbite, um, you know, diseases of exposure and then infectious diseases and complications of infections uh, in an era before antibiotics. Um, he became known as a specialist in what was called blood poisoning then, and what in modern biomedical terminology we would call sepsis today, which is, is a very serious uh, disease. It's considered a, a medical emergency. It's a leading cause of death 
uh, to this day, and millions of people die each year of sepsis. Um, it's treated uh, with very heavy rounds of antibiotics and steroids uh, in a modern biomedical context. And he was very successful at treating it with, uh, with Chinese herbs in the, in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, in terms of epidemic diseases, it's noted that he treated many cases of influenza during the 1918-1919 pandemic. And according to local lore, none of his patients died. There's at least one documented case of a, a crew of road workers uh, building one of the first modern highways uh, or at least modern roads through the John Day area. Um, these, this camp of workers all came down with influenza uh, and Doc Hay came out to meet them, basically brewed up a bunch of herbs, gave it to them, and they were they became well enough to continue working, finish uh, building the road on time. So I think that's that's really remarkable. Um, this is where he practiced medicine uh, at the Kemwa Chung. It is now a museum and national historical landmark in John Day. Um, it's really remarkable because a lot of the products that would have been sold and used as medicine uh, were preserved. Um, so it's it's a place of great historical interest, uh, both to people who are interested in Chinese American history and then people who are interested specifically in Chinese medicine, um, because there's lots of recipes and uh, lots of the herbal formulas that he would have been using. Um, the list of ingredients are there. There's correspondence with patients. Um, interesting to note, too, there were this, uh, the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of uncashed checks from patients were found among his papers. Um, so I think that speaks very highly of his character. He would have been treating patients uh, during the Great Depression, as well as just rural folk who probably didn't have much in the way of, of extra income. And it seems that for a significant portion of his patients, he just waived payment altogether. And you can see some, some photos of the interior there. Um, so jumping ahead a little bit, Chinese medicine continues to be practiced uh, amongst the ethnic Chinese in America, largely within Chinatowns um, and largely underground. Uh, one thing I should mention is that Doc Hay was actually arrested, um, or at least they tried to arrest him many times for practicing medicine without a license, but the community in John Day, both the Chinese community and the white settler community that he was treating kind of closed ranks to protect him. Um, you know, and so you have Chinese medicine to continue continuously being practiced, but it's more or less underground. That starts to change uh, beginning in the 60s and 70s. And just to give you a little bit of background, I'm sure most, most of you know that this was a very tumultuous period in American history. It's the height of the civil rights movement. And you have a lot of um, activist groups forming around the country um, looking to secure equal rights for minority groups looking to challenge the foundations of systemic racism and oppression. Um, some of these groups uh, you can see here, you've got the Young Lords. This was a Puerto Rican group advocating for better civil rights for Puerto Ricans in the US as well, in the US mainland, I should say rather, as well as for independence for the island of Puerto Rico. Um, and then the Black Panthers, which is an African-American group advocating for equal rights for African-Americans. Um, I would say both the proponents and the detractors of these groups tend to focus on the fact that they were very militant in their aesthetics and that they focused heavily on community self-defense. Uh, both groups had armed patrols, um, essentially uh, protecting neighborhoods and communities from racists, from police oppression. Um, but I want to emphasize that in addition to self-defense, both of these groups really were interested in providing social services for those communities. That includes things like uh, breakfast programs for youth, that was a, a major social program instituted by the Black Panthers, as well as healthcare and free clinics. And so this is kind of where Chinese medicine comes in. So in the 1970s and 80s, you have a heroin epidemic in the South Bronx. The South Bronx is a community that is uh, largely Puerto Rican and Black demographically. Um, it's experiencing a really high rate of unemployment and poverty in the 70s and 80s, something like 40% unemployment rate, 50% higher mortality rate than the rest of the country, and some of the highest uh, rates of drug use in the world at this time. Um, there's only one hospital. It's a dilapidated building. Uh, you know, the only, it takes months to get into a treatment program if, for addiction, and the only service that they're really offering at this point is uh, methadone as maintenance. This was unacceptable to a lot of members of the community who saw this as essentially 
um, just trading one type of addiction for another. And it was a, an addiction that was sponsored by a government that they felt was, was very oppressive towards their community. So beginning in 1970, they decided to take matters into their own hands, members of the Young Lords, the Black Panthers, uh, Students for a Democratic Society, other community groups took over the hospital and demanded that the city establish a community health center with an emphasis on non-chemical treatments for addiction. The, community, the city of New York actually agreed to these demands and they diverted funding towards a new community program that was set up to explore non-chemical treatments for addiction. And one of those treatments was Chinese medicine, specifically acupuncture. Starting in 1974, you start to have acupuncture um, at what was then called the Lincoln Detox Program. Um, you have doctors uh, bringing in acupuncturists from Chinatown. They're starting to explore the use of acupuncture as an adjunctive therapy. Um, and one of the political education instructors there at this time, a man named Matulu Shakur, uh, if that last name sounds familiar to you, it's because this gentleman is the stepfather of 90s rapper Tupac Shakur. Um, but at this time, he's a political education instructor at Lincoln Detox. Uh, he becomes very interested in Chinese medicine uh, and really becomes a strong advocate for including it as part of the detox program. Um, Matulu and several others from the program travel to Montreal, Canada, which is one of the only places in North America in the 1970s where you can actually receive training uh, in acupuncture and Chinese medicine at this time. He becomes a doctor of acupuncture. And in 1977, Dr. Shakur and his colleagues develop a protocol for treating addiction with acupuncture that is still used to this day. It becomes very successful. Um, you have hundreds of people in the community benefiting from this treatment. Um, you actually have international acclaim from acupuncture societies in Asia and around the world. Even the UN uh, notes that this is a very successful program. Unfortunately, it is forcibly closed a few years later um, one of the, the doctors in charge of the program there dies under suspicious circumstances. The program is, is shut down. Um, and then shortly after, Dr. Shakur is uh, embroiled in conspiracy charges. He's arrested. He actually remains incarcerated today. We don't have time to get into the sort of ins and outs of that case. I will just note that uh, supporters of the clinic feel that the, the closure of the clinic and then the charges against Dr. Shakur were primarily politically motivated. There's a great documentary called Dope is Death that you can check out uh, that delves more deeply into the circumstances surrounding the closure of the clinic. Um, that said, the, even though that particular program was shut down, the protocol that was created remains in use to this day. Other community centers uh, essentially opened up around the, the country and around the world. And so there's hundreds of people using the acupuncture protocol that Dr. Shakur and his colleagues developed. Um, notably, the, the National Acute Detox Association, which was founded in 1985 by uh, Dr. Michael Smith, who is a psychiatrist and a doctor of acupuncture, um, one of the original founders of the Lincoln Detox Center. That's still operating today. This is a picture of the protocol. Um, it involves uh, just some acupuncture points on the ear. So it's um, you can basically perform this very easily. I've performed it myself. Um, some of my Clinical training was done in inpatient detoxification centers. And this is often performed in a group setting. And, um, and this is called community acupuncture when you're performing it in a group setting. And it's argued that part of the, the healing process there comes from people coming together. And this was developed um, in the South Bronx primarily to treat addiction, but today it's, it's used for a wider range of issues as well. Uh, acupuncture also and Chinese medicine played a role in the AIDS epidemic of the 80s and 90s. I think something that is often, um, you know, forgotten today is how much fear and uncertainty was uh, surrounding the um, emergence of AIDS in the early 1980s and how long it took really for effective treatments to be developed. Um, you know, we, so you first started to hear uh, clinical reports of AIDS in the 80s. Um, HIV was identified. Uh, in 1983, you've got the first antiretroviral treatments available in the mid 80s, but you don't really have, I would say, uh, comprehensive treatment until the mid 90s. Um, There's a lot of fear and stigma and uncertainty surrounding the disease. It was unfairly labeled uh, a problem that was only affecting gay men and therefore perhaps not something that was, uh, you know, worth studying. And so there was a lot of activism. Uh, that was involved essentially in helping to spur reform and research, especially in the United States. Um, 
During those early days in the 80s, um, a doctor of Chinese medicine, Nisha Cohen, um, founded a Chinese medicine clinic that was specifically focused on the treatment of HIV and AIDS. This was in 1984 in San Francisco. Um, it was the first clinic of its, of its kind uh, that was specifically devoted to this. Um, and for many years, this clinic provided immune enhancements, uh, treatment of opportunistic infections, treatment of things like uh, muscle wasting, diarrhea, diarrhea, and you know, unfortunately, palliative care for advanced cases. Um, Dr. Cohen collaborated with doctors from around the world on research, and she pioneered herbal medicines that were specific for HIV positive people. Um, she's still in practice today in San Francisco. She continues to treat patients, conduct research, and teach. Um, and in addition to HIV, she's also an expert in the use of Chinese medicine for treating uh, chronic infections like hepatitis C and uh, reproductive medicine more generally. This brings us to, I would say, about up, up to the, the present day. Um, and so if you had asked me before 2020 kind of what the major health crisis or major epidemic disease uh, of, of our time would be, I would say it would probably be this, the opioid crisis. Um, I think that with all the, the emphasis on COVID-19, something that might be forgotten is that this is still an epidemic that is raging across the United States. Um, for about the past 10 years or so, there have been record levels of opioid overdoses. And I think that this needs to be considered in the context of rising levels of what are called deaths of despair. And this includes chronic pain, this includes deaths by suicide, drug overdoses, as well as uh, diseases like alcohol-related uh, liver cirrhosis. Um, all of these are on the rise at a level in the United States that is really unprecedented in other uh, developed countries. You don't see this in Europe, you don't see this in Asian countries, um, but for the past 10 years, these have all been on the rise in the United States. Um, because of all the attention on COVID-19, it's, it's not clear yet what the numbers are looking like over the past year, but preliminary research suggests that these numbers are going to continue to rise. Um, and so this is an area that Chinese medicine has been, Chinese medicine practitioner, practitioners have been on the front lines of treating. Um, and increasingly, there's been recognition that Chinese medicine can provide frontline non-pharmacological solutions to things like pain management, addiction recovery, as we saw in the, the pioneering programs in the South Bronx. Um, where I practice in South Florida, it's become uh, the law actually that medical doctors have to provide patients with pamphlets saying essentially that there are non-pharmacological options for pain management and that uh, they're encouraged to, to have patients seek these out before turning towards opioids. Um, the US military as well has also started to incorporate acupuncture and Chinese medicine modalities um, into, into work with veterans. So there's been, there's been uh, increasing signs of recognition, I would say, from the mainstream, but on a community level, uh, I would say Chinese medicine continues to, to provide options for people who are, who are struggling with these. In terms of COVID-19, um, you know, during the pandemic, Chinese medicine providers in the United States have continued to support their communities with Chinese medicine, often using telemedicine. Um, you know, so instead of acupuncture being, I feel like acupuncture is often the form of Chinese medicine that most people are familiar with. Um, and it's often what most people have experienced, but uh, due to the pandemic, due to social distancing, um, it's herbal medicine that has kind of come a little bit more to the forefront. Um, I know providers in California, which has been one of the hardest hit uh, parts of the country with COVID-19, who have treated dozens of cases, um, you know, everything from mild to, to moderate forms of the illness, as well as people who are struggling with long-term complications. Um, I think it's important to note that um, in China, and uh, Dr. Rio will no doubt have, have more to say about this in a few minutes, that over 90% of patients have received herbal medicine alongside biomedical treatments. And there's a lot of re research that suggests treatment with Chinese herbal medicine can improve clinical outcomes of patients uh, with COVID-19. Something I'm working on personally is uh, the creation of a project that will work to help people who are suffering with long-term complications of COVID-19. Oftentimes, uh, months after an initial infection, patients are still struggling with things like shortness of breath, chronic fatigue, um, you know, strange aches and pains. Um, and Chinese medicine, I think, has, has a lot to offer these patients. Um, so this is a, this is a chapter of uh, the history of Chinese medicine is community medicine in the United States that is still being written. Um, I think that's, that's all that I, I have to say on the subject. I hope that, you know, um, 
for many of you, you might not have been aware of the role that Chinese medicine has played in, in providing uh, health for various marginalized communities. So hopefully this is a little window into that. It's definitely not a complete history. This is more of a, I would say, kind of a, a highlights or, or greatest hits. Um, you know, and if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to, to answer those after. So what you're not able to see is that each one of these talks, as well as the others that are not recorded, that are not part of this webinar, actually produced a lot of really great discussion, um, in-depth um, conversation with uh, faculty, but mostly with students that attended these events um, when, when we held them live. And um, so we're not gonna be able to do that here because this is not a live webinar, but what uh, I would like to invite everybody to do is to join uh, in a conversation on Facebook. We're going to post uh, this webinar on the Asian Medicine Zone um, group in Facebook that I think most members of ISM are part of. And we will have the panelists there um, as part of the uh, Facebook group as well. And we will be able to field some questions and continue the conversation there in this um, asynchronous format. Um, so I want to just take a moment to thank um, all of you for watching and um, to thank you in advance for your participation in the conversation uh, that will take place afterwards. Um, I want to thank the panelists, the three who are here, the um, eight others who, whose um, presentations are not part of this webinar who participated in the Health Humanities Speaker Series. Um, we had a really great conversation there. Um, I also should thank the Penn State um, General Education Micro Grant, as well as the Academic Environment Committee that paid for the honoraria for our speakers and that made, uh, made helped out with some logistics and so forth in making these um, the speaker series happen. And um, so I wanna thank all of you for being here once more and have a wonderful day.